It's a brand new week. Thank you for joining us on Business Morning. I am BC Adbayo. Let's kick off the show with the latest coming from the international oil markets where prices are trending lower this morning. Prices were initially higher as a tropical storm took aim for the U.S. Gulf of Mexico region, halting some production, although price gains were capped by the potential return of oil output in Libya and, of course, a continued rise in coronavirus cases. But then we saw Brent crude decline uh, by more than 1% at $42.68 a barrel, while U.S. crude was also down more than 1% at $40.63 a barrel. Meanwhile, oil and gas producers had been restarting their offshore operations over the weekend after being disrupted by Sally for some 17% of U.S. Gulf of Mexico offshore oil production and nearly 13% of natural gas output went offline on Saturday in the face of Hurricane Sally's waves and winds. Well, elsewhere, Libya's National Oil Corps lifted force majeure on what it deemed secure oil ports and facilities on Saturday, but then said that the measure would remain in place for facilities where fighters remain. A resurgence of virus cases globally is also acting as a break on crude demand. And bringing things back home now, the registration portal for 75 billion Naira micro, small and medium enterprises survival fund and guaranteed offtake scheme will be opened by 10 p.m. today for prospective beneficiaries. According to a statement of the Project Delivery Office, the Business Support Initiative will reach out to 1.7 million individuals and entities across the country for an initial three-month period. The schedule for registration shows that the first phase will be for payroll support scheme and interested Nigerians in educational institutions will start their registration tonight, followed by the businesses in the hospital industry, uh, which will commence midnight of Friday, September the 25th. The portal will also be open to other categories of small businesses from 12 uh, a.m. on Monday, September the 28th. And more headlines, the Securities and Exchange Commission has said that it has the capacity to regulate trades in crypto assets and other digital offerings in the country. According to the Commission in a statement, the need to regulate the market is born out of the increased interest of the younger generation in the asset. Last week, the Commission released a guideline for the registration of sponsors and issuers playing actively in the country, giving existing operators a three-month window to regulate Clarifying its decision to regulate the instrument, the SEC says it's part of determination to boost investors' protection in the investment climate. Well, let's get to our conversations now. And the Federal Inland Revenue Service recently directed persons holding accounts across all forms of Nigerian financial institutions to fill and submit a new self-certification form made available on its website. According to the service, the forms are required by the relevant financial institutions to carry out due diligence procedures in line with the income tax regulations of 2019, but haven't been received with immediate mixed reactions last week. The FRX explains that uh, the demand is not targeted at all Nigerians but persons of interest. Well, to understand the objectives of this exercise, we're now being joined by the manager at Anderson Tax Nigeria, Emmanuel Onosami, for some analysis. Good morning. Thank you for joining us on the program. Well, let's start off with you giving us a sense of what the self-certification exercise aims to achieve and who are the people who are actually affected by the common reporting standard regulations? Yeah, thank you very much uh, for having me. And uh, to start uh, this conversation, I would like to give a, a background to help our audience understand uh, the common reporting standard. And if you can recall the global crisis that happened in 2005 to 2007, you know, that led the government of the world to start uh, thinking again about how they could wrap up uh, tax income for the purpose of governance, you know. That led uh, the, uh, the government through the United Nations in cooperation with the OECD to commission a project that was called the BEPS uh, Ration and Profit Shifting Project. And one of the key pillars of that project is tax transparency. 
you know, before now, you know, government realized that there are some taxpayers because they are not physically resident in a location, they dodge the tax obligation in that location. So because of that, uh, the CRS is one of the projects of the whole city that is targeted uh, to ensure that there is tax transparency, among other reasons like countering, uh, terrorism, sponsoring, and all, all other reasons. To so explain this in a layman language, what the government of the world they are trying to achieve is that if you're not currently uh, uh, resident in a country, you are tax resident in that country to ensure that you are actually discharging your tax obligation in that country. So I will say again, you know, this is how it works. I could be a Nigerian and I'm resident in Nigeria, but I hope I have access in the UK where I put those uh, property for rent and I earn income in the UK. Although I'm not a UK citizen or a UK resident, based on that income that I'm earning from UK, there's an expectation that I meet some tax obligation. You know, based on that, uh, the government of the world said there are so many leakages around these taxes and they are unable to track because there is no transparency around it. Similarly, in Nigeria, in Nigeria, based on the Nigerian law, you know, you are expected to pay your, uh, your tax in, uh, taxes based on your global income, meaning as a Nigerian, if I have uh, income from the United States or have income from anywhere around in the world, I'm expected to pay tax in Nigeria based on that, my global income. But where there is no transparency about that income, you know, the government potentially lose from, uh, from some such revenue. So what did the CRS come to address? The CRS come to address where government of the world put the multilateral instrument. So in 2017, they signed an agreement where they agree with the global community to share information about uh, people in Nigeria that have tax obligation outside Nigeria with any relevant country and vice versa. Meaning Nigeria also will be receiving this kind of information for the purpose uh, of uh, tax assessment. So recently, Nigeria domesticated that law in Nigeria through the Income uh, Tax Reporting Standard Regulation, where uh, the Nigerian financial institutions are primarily obligated to obtain this kind of information from our holders, share it with the tax authority, who will then forward it to the relevant country that uh, is interested in such information. So that is basically how the CRS uh, framework is expected to work. It's a task transparency tool just for the purpose of risk assessment and not necessarily to tax uh, the people for that. Yeah. Now, having given us that background now, how would you help us to understand the difference between the common reporting standard and the transfer pricing? So, you know, like I said, transfer pricing is also one of the two that the United Nations through the OECD is using to tackle possible tax evasion, you know. Why transfer pricing speaks to the fact that uh, multinational companies uh, and uh, putting related party transactions for possible uh, tax uh, advantage, you know. But the CRA regulation is just saying that, look, I don't have a clear picture of where all your assets are and I want to have information about it so that I can reconcile your asset with your tax history. So it's a simple risk assessment tool. Once I have information about your tax as, uh, your asset globally, I can then reconcile that with your tax obligation wherever you have a tax obligation. So the transfer pricing is one leg trying to see the transaction of multinationals between uh, sister companies to ensure that it reflects uh, commercial terms and not, uh, not necessarily because they want to use it to achieve tax advantage, but the CRA, in order to for example, they are trying to give us a clear job of the aspect of tax and to reconcile this information with tax history of, of that aspect. Now, for those who are uh, that's during in the diaspora who are coming down, how will they get to take in the exercise? Will the IRS have to set up registry points outside the country as we saw during the BV administration? Okay, so uh, if I could provide some uh, explanation on that, uh, you know, the federal government on the two communicated uh, who should walk into the bank and obtain the certification from and uh, complete it for the purpose of, of, of this report. So try to provide brand how the CRS is better, you know. The Nigerian regulation completely that is in sync with the OECD standard that was set for the purpose of this CRS regulation. And one of the things that the OECD has stressed is that this is going to be a systematic uh, exercise, you know. It's not just only Nigerians in diaspora that are required to report. Even Nigerians that are resident, according to the OECD framework, are required to report to the extent that you have tax exposure in other countries. 
So what the OECD standard has recommended is to break down this exercise into phases. So we have categories of account holders that are currently being reviewed, and the financial institution are expected to report on them come September 30th. You know? But there are some other categories of, uh, of account holders that will be reported in later days. We have May next year and then subsequent years. It's going to be an annual reporting framework. And based on this, what is the OECD framework recommend is that the financial institutions are required to carry out a due diligence. So what that due diligence is supposed to do is for them to review the information that is currently domiciled with them. And if they are able to ascertain that any account holder has participation outside Nigeria, then they can make a decision on that and report such a quota. Otherwise, they will then need to do a full self-certification exercise. That simple certification exercise means that let the account holder by him or herself put it on the form and sign the app obligation outside the network where it's that the financial institution not very best information. So the way the is pretty much supposed to work is when the financial institution review their records and they that on them to decide on the information currently available with them, whether you are reportable or not, meaning whether you have that obligation outside Nigeria or not, then they will then reach out to that account holder to complete the self-certification exercise. You know, but because uh, we are running out of time, and I understand where the government is coming from, that if we could get everybody to do it at the go, then it will make administration easy for the financial institution. But as of as today, based on the OECD framework, for the people that will be reported in September, we are aware that the financial institution have already reached out to these people. And what uh, will also be good that the government can do is to just uh, make it known to the people that they need to cooperate as much as possible. Because according to the OECD framework, where an account holder refused to provide this information to the financial institution, the financial institution is expected to report this account order to the government, which will then take it further for possible investigation or, or, or any other activity they want to do with that. So the big takeaway for Nigerians uh, from this is that you are, you are not, it's not an automatic reporting when you fill that form. You know, when they reach out to you to fill that form, you are expected to indicate whether you are taxable in other jurisdiction or not. And based on that, they will make a determination whether you are going to be reported or not. But if you refuse to do that, then what you are telling the financial institution to do is to report you automatically. Now, talking about the role of the financial institutions, now, of course, we know that this exercise cuts across all of them. That's talking about uh, insurance, brokerage firms, mortgage banks, discount houses. Uh, what's the significance mm -hmm. of the broad spectrum of registrations? So the, the, the entire idea is that uh, if you have assets, you know, you will definitely be keeping it with the financial house, you know. And the tax authority ordinarily will not have purview over this asset, but the financial institution. And that is why, based on the framework of the CRS uh, regulation, the financial institution are a key stakeholder that will help in, uh, in uh, ensuring this, uh, this, uh, that they achieve the objective that the United Nations and the government of the world seeks to achieve. So the, the, the financial institution, if you are keeping deposits, if you are managing asset, managing portfolio, you are managing trust, you know, these are potential avenues that people can uh, keep their assets and such that is not visible to, to, to the tax authority. So if you find yourself as a financial institution, then uh, covering all these kind of uh, services, then you will definitely be required to comply uh, with this regulation. And to my understanding, the people that are primarily obliged under the regulation are the uh, financial institution. And if you fail to do this, you know, there are consequent penalties for not uh, complying. Now, these are pretty tough times for the economy, especially uh, caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, the nation is looking for ways to increase revenue. So how will this exercise enable the FIRS to broaden the country's tax net? Yeah, and uh, that's primarily one of the objectives, you know. Uh, the exercise is, is 
trying, is seeking to close uh, the, the tax leakage gap that we currently have. You know, if you look at it from the perspective of the FRS, they are Nigerians that could have filed their tax uh, reports, you know, annually based on limited information that they, 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 they are limited activities that they have within the country. And if you submit that with the tax authority, the tax authority will simply rely on that for the purpose of your tax assessment. You know, but with this framework, once it goes live, you know, Nigeria is then going to also be receiving reports from other countries about other Nigerians that have accounts outside Nigeria and have other income that are supposed to be taxable in Nigeria. And for that purpose, you know, if the taxman mined this information uh, very effectively and efficiently, it is expected that uh, you are going to further widen the tax net and then further even increase the potential of collecting more taxes that is required for, for governance. Yeah. Well, do we have any idea how much could be realized in taxes from this exercise? You know, uh, today, uh, very luckily, you know, the, uh, an international media released a report on uh, United States uh, FinCEN, you know, Financial Crimes uh, Network, uh, Enforcement Network, uh, uh, claiming that there are some of the big banks that have that have been uh, using uh, assisting people to him to, to layer some funds and all that and those are part of the consideration that the crs is trying to to, to address you know the potential can only be <laughs> can, cannot be quantified but you know for you to be able to have information about everybody that is subjected to tax in your country then the potential will only be re realized where the tax authority in nigeria put in place framework such that it's effective to analyze the data that are being shared and pursue those people that they think in their assessment have understated their income for the purpose of taxes. So the potential is uh, far reaching to the extent that the tax uh, man is able to mine this data that are going to be shared under the CRS framework. Yeah. Now, one question many have asked is that why is the FIRS not uh, leveraging other existing data and identification silos or better still partner with the other sectoral regulations to obtain this data? Thank you very much for that question. And uh, I, I would like to respond this way. Uh, if you understand that taxation matters are evolving and they are developing. You know, you know, we've seen in the social media space where people are saying, why can't you integrate the BVM with other data of other agencies to get uh, this information? But uh, today, you know, in developed countries where you have uh, this kind of information, they've been able to aggregate those data and then limit uh, the exposure to, to get uh, reaching out to uh, account to that to fill the certification form. But in Nigeria, if you look at it, even when they are doing the, when we were going about the BBN exercise or any other regulatory agency exercise, there is no aspect of that uh, exercise that requested that people should complete uh, information about their tax exposure outside Nigeria. So if you understand the CRS framework and now what they are trying to achieve, you will see that this certification exercise where the bank deemed it necessary uh, is, is unavoidable and people should just uh, primarily cooperate uh, with, with the financial institution to the extent that, you know, they, they have obligations uh, outside Nigeria. All right, we'll have to leave the conversation at this point. Manager at Anderson Tax Nigeria, Emmanuel Onosami, thanks for coming on the program. Thank you for having me. Thank you. When we return in just a moment, we'll be analyzing the World Bank 2020 Human Capital Index reading. Do stay with us. Welcome back. The World Bank recently reported that the COVID-19 pandemic is threatening to roll back gains achieved in the health and education over the past decade, especially in low-income countries. In its Human Capital Index report for 2020, which is measured in terms of productivity of the next generation of workers relative to the benchmark of complete education and full health, Nigeria ranges 0.36 points in value and is deemed as low middle income economy alongside Vietnam. Nigeria is also one of the four countries where under five mortality rates have changed by more than 10 deaths per 1,000 live births. Now, the largest revisions is reported for Nigeria, which moves from 100 to 122 deaths per 1,000 live births after Guinea. 
Well, joining us to examine this report now is a development strategist, Dr. Emeka Okengu, who joins us from our studio in Abuja. Good morning, Dr. Okengu. Thanks for joining us on the program. Well, how Good do morning. you thank, think... Thank, thank, thanks for having me. All right. So how do you think the COVID-19 pandemic has reversed the marginal gains that, achieved, that was achieved by some African countries, including Nigeria, in improving the quality of their human capital? Well, it's, it's very clear. You've read it all out. It's, it's there for all to see. Uh, but uh, you, let's, let's call it the initial shock. Uh, let's not talk about how he has reversed it. Let's talk about how we can now, you know, beat it, how we can be able to also push back. Uh, that, that's, that's what's more important. Because if you look at the reports that you're actually referring to, it didn't clearly state or focus on any country. It's, it's global. Uh, what the pandemic has done is it has already rolled back, you know, practically everything to maybe what you might be able to call to point zero. So uh, the, the, the losses are there, the, expect, the expectations were there, we didn't expect any less, okay? But what is important is, you know, trying to interrogate uh, how we can be able to push back. And I think we'll have a lot of opportunities and chances of pushing back, you know, both on the health and the education that you're talking about, if we can get innovative, you know, and well, innovative, uh, indigenously, if you may, you know, in trying to do this pushing back. It's, of course, there's no way you can talk about, you know, the COVID-19 not impacting on the health and education sectors. People haven't been in schools, hospitals, you know, our healthcare system, he that or even before the, the scrudge, you know, was challenged. And then with the scrudge, uh, you find out that it's, it's, it was much more, more, more exposed. But I think it's also a wake-up call for us to be able to now, you know, begin a pushback, if you may. All right, then. Well, considering the importance of human capital in the growth uh, development process, how would you rate the efforts or the performance of the current administration as far as human capital development is concerned? You're, you're going to be looking at the human capital development against... Uh, the age of uh, 18, you know, what was expected of you uh, when you get to, to 18 vis-a-vis -vis formal education. If you're looking at it from the perspective of formal education, yes, I don't think we've done very badly. Okay, where I think we'll have more of a challenge in uh, human capital development is being able to now, you know, capture those that uh, have been lost to the attrition of that education gap of uh, zero to 18. Where, where are you when you're 18 vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, the skills you've acquired? Uh, the formal education uh, probably isn't the best we should be looking at now, if we are really thinking about, you know, the new normal or the new context. Because if we want to contextualize it, we should be now looking at uh, life skills as more, you know, integral, more important, you know, to our human capital development index going forward. We should be looking at our health. What are those things that you need? You know, what kind of education do you need, you know, for us to be able to probably also address or redress, you know, the challenges we're having, the health issues? I don't think government has done, you know, very well when it comes to that informal. And this is where you have the bulk, you know, of a country. But with the formal education thing, I also think that there more needs to be done. Even when we're talking about the formal education that we seem to have, uh, you know, gotten some kind of, uh, you know, grip. It, it's important that in discussing our human capital index, what I, the point I'm trying to make is that we can't be discussing it against, you know, what we call the traditional lines. It's, it's, it's that, no, that is not going to be working for us. What we need to do is to first and foremost use probably the age 18 as a benchmark to say, okay, at age 18, what skills, what, what, uh, what uh, equipment, you know, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, education, vis-a-vis -vis skills, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, 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 equipment that you need to be able to survive, you know, in the post-COVID context. You know, because people keep talking about yeah, COVID, COVID, and I keep saying COVID is here to stay. Let's just know that it, there will never be that old order again. And then in using the old order to measure, I don't think we might be getting it, you know, very, very correctly. That's, that's the point I'm trying to push across. Now, I'd like to focus on a part of that report, which talks about the uh, impact of human capital increases with rising conflict severity. Of course, uh, children living in areas of Nigeria that were heavily affected by Boko Haram insurgency had higher probability of wasting than the children who were in less affected areas. Now, taking this to mind, what steps do you think the federal government or the subnational in the northern region can actually take to safeguard the material wellness of these children? 
True. You're, you're, you, you seem to be focusing on the formal, formal education, which, which, like I said to you, uh, we, I, I appreciate. I mean, is uh, in in the northeast zone, uh, they, they have lost over 18, 18 to twenty years of formal education. There is no doubt about it. But when we are talking about skills, when we are talking about you know life skills, you know the kind of education that now you know makes you technically competent, you, you, it does not necessarily have to come from your formal education. So what I'm trying to say is that what's important for us in redefining our human capital development, we should not be using the basis of a formal education, you know, that gives you the six, uh, six, uh, three. By the time you get to 18, then you would have maybe gotten into the university or gotten into a higher school. Now, we have a situation where we've lost a lot of, you know, our young people to this attrition of uh, 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 the Boko Haram insurgencies and social disorders and name this and name that. And then it's, it's been worsened, you know, by the COVID-19. But what I'm trying to say is that it's also a wake-up call for us to be able to now redefine, you know, our own locally, uh, uh, our own local measurements, you know, for us to be able to now determine what our human capital development index should be, you know, using the H18, okay, as our index, okay, or as our, as our means of measurement. So, in the North East that you're talking about, we've lost a lot of these young men, you know, to the attrition of formal education that hasn't functioned, you know, at its best. I mean, it's, it's been very minimal. But can we also now develop, you know, strategies to also now equip them with the necessary skills going forward? That should be the challenge. And I think it's the way government must look if we're going to be making any, any progress or success in that direction. Now, let's look at the other aspects of the report, which is talking about the fact that Nigeria has one of the highest under five mortality rates in sub-Saharan Africa. Of course, the under five mortality rate for Nigeria was revised from 100 deaths per 1,000 live births to 122 deaths. What do you think are the root causes behind Nigeria's alarming under five mortality rates? A neglect of our primary health institutions. That's what it is. It, it's, it's quite so rendering that, I mean, you go to, you go to our local areas and uh, you, 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 you'll, you'll be amazed or shocked. You, you, you'll be traumatized at what you see, you know, so even at the attempt that we're not talking about hospitals now. We're not even talking about health facilities. We're talking about primary health centers. You'll be shocked at, you know, the, the, it, it, when they are there, they are far and in between. And when you see them, they are, they are just, they are rat shitholes. I'm, I'm sorry to use, you know, that kind of word on a national television, but that's, how, that, that, that's what describes it. it it's, it's so rendering. So I think that the, the, what we should focus on, and a lot of these, you know, deaths are caught at that lower, lower level of the subnationals, which is where you have your rural communities. And this is where a lot of Nigerians live. This is where, you know, the, those who are living under the, you know, breadline reside. So I think the focus should be on making certain that we now have minimums or standards for our primary health care, you know, uh, uh, facilities. The moment we get that right, then there, there has to be an integration between those primary health care, you know, facilities that are non-existent or non-functional where they are or non-equipped, you know, where functional uh, with either human capital or equipment or, or drugs. Now, there should be some kind of synergy between them and then your general hospitals are leading up to, you know, your specialist substitutes. If we don't build that synergy, we're, we're going to be having a health crunch that I, I don't, I think the 5% you talked about is actually underreported. It is much, much, much more worse than that. I can assure you, you know, remembering that a senior government official had, you know, in, in, at the beginning of his uh, scrutch, said he was alarmed at what he saw when he moved around the country. Uh, it's, it's worse than that, really. And, you know, with the debt of funds, uh, very few uh, going into probably building, not even equipping or, you know, sustaining the ones that are existing. I don't see, you know, how we are going to not be getting deeper into this, you know, trauma if we're not addressing that issue. Uh, it's, it's worse than even what is happening in the education sector, if, if you ask me. Now, you've talked about, of course, uh, equipping the young ones with the adequate skills. But then what do you make of the unemployment rates, uh, which the World Bank says one in five households in Nigeria lost all employment and that despite some signs of recovery in employment, we have more than half of households who are reporting income losses, which uh, has further led to food insecurity due to the inability to purchase food. Again, you're looking at the formal sector. Why aren't we looking at? Why aren't we looking at the informal sector? Why aren't we looking at, you know, the value chains? Okay, because if you're looking at employment, a government is not an employment of labor. Shouldn't be an employment of labor. 
Now, is it not a paradox that you have a country with 86 million you know, hectares of land? Okay, arable land, and you're talking about unemployment. Is it not a paradox that you have over 300 dams or so in Nigeria and we're importing over 2 million metric tons you know, of the shortfall of uh, fisheries and aquatic uh, uh, needs that we have? Is it, not, is it not a paradox that you have all this arable land and we're importing corn and maize you know, for us to be able to support uh, our nutrition needs for both uh, uh, human and, uh, uh, and animals? So it, it, it's all about our re readdressing and reordering our priorities. And the priority should be first for me, food security. And everybody can go back to the land in one way or the other. That's what China did. China didn't start by becoming a technological giant, if you, if you may. They started by now aggregating their rural people to start producing you know, what they were going to be eating. And that's exactly what we can do in Nigeria. So if you're talking about unemployment, are you talking about formal employment? Or are you talking about you know, being engaged? These are two different things. And being engaged is all about you earning revenue, you becoming credit worthy. And you don't have to work in a government office wearing tie and suit to be employed. That's the point I'm trying to make. So it's, 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 it's actually not right. It's actually not a discussion we should be having. Government, you know, and this has given us a very clear opportunity for us to be able to, you know, rewrite how we do things. We have land, arable land. We have infrastructure, you know, a lot of them. Like I just mentioned the dams, okay, that we can actually start applying to begin to now develop some intermodal relationship between our, our agriculture and our transportation and our mining industry. I, for, for crying out aloud, don't forget that Nigeria at one time, you know, was the biggest, you know, producer of uh, columbites globally and the eighth biggest of tin ore, you know, in the world. We have all these uh, mining, uh, mining potentials. I don't want to say resources because you need to do, you know, a lot of uh, findings to be able to find them. So if, 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 if we can be able to readdress, look at, three critical areas. And critical area number one is how do we convert our present human resources human, into human capital? And do we need just formal education to do that? No. You can also now begin to you know, use your, your skills education, your, your trade centers are used to you know, develop a lot of skilled personnel before. We can return them into service, okay? And then we think about how we can be able to now engage either in the ag agriculture sector, not just by the a production of crops, but by now, you know, the value chain of agriculture that is practically endless, ditto for the mining sector. Okay, so if we're able to do this, I think uh, we, in, in the next uh, a couple of years, trust me, we can, we, you can get 100 people, 100 million people, uh, sorry, engaged in one form of activity or the other that can now start earning some kind of income for them. And then you will stop talking about unemployment. I think that's the way to go. All right, we'd like to thank you, development strategist Dr. Emeka Okengu, for sharing some of your thoughts with us on the program this morning. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Well, let's now get a review of last week's performance at the Nigerian equities market, and Eddie Young Iwang will be doing that for us. Good morning, Eddie. Hope you had a great weekend. Of course, uh, just let's have the numbers. Good morning, BC. Well, I had a great weekend. I hope you did as well. But as global equity markets rebounded last week due to um, news of a possible coronavirus vaccine and IPOs and corporate dealings, the market in Nigeria declined for the second consecutive week as the all share index declined 0.08% to 25,572.57. Now, although the all share index declined, the market cap was high about 0.10%. We saw about 1.13 billion units worth 12.69 billion era, all traded in 17,109 deals. The sexual chart was mostly positive, apart from the banking sector and oil and gas counter, which declined. Banking was down due to declines from Zenith Bank, FBN Holdings, Ecobank Transnational, and and Stambic Bank, consumer goods was up 0.13%, industrial goods was up 0.50%, while insurance was also up 0.10%. The oil and gas sector was down 0.13%. At the unlisted securities market, that segment of the market was up by 1.05% to 720.02 points, while the market cap was higher, about 528.90 billion naira. We saw about 3.24 million units worth 108.40 million are traded in 39 deals. But let's talk to Afalabi Benro, a stockbroker at Stambik IBTC. 
Good morning, Nafalabi. Thank you for joining us on the program. Good morning. Thanks for having me. So this is the second consecutive weekly decline we've seen in the market. Should we be expecting the same sentiment this week? Yes, I think the sentiment will probably be the same. Um, last week, we saw um, a bit of activity in mostly GCB, um, Zenith Bank, and MCN. GCB and Zenith was a mix of both local and international participation. I mean, MCN, it was uh, mostly local participation. Um, there was a bit of volatility. Um, we saw some um, markdown. Um, we saw some of the names markdown for interim dividend, UBA, GCB, Stambic, Zenith and Access. Um, and, as a bit, and as a result of that, um, there was some interest generated from investors. Uh, but generally, the trend um, in the market is still the same. Um, there's still no major um, catalyst um, driving the market um, at the moment. So we expect the sentiments to, to, to be the same with a bit of volatility. With lower yields in the fixed income space, should we be expecting more investors in the equities market? Yes, I think it's 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 um, it's, it's equities is, is an asset class that um, um, investors are looking at now because of um, the low, lower yield in um, the fixed income space. Uh, there's a lot of speculative activity going on in the market, and um, a lot of investors are just looking for better returns. So we expect that um, there will be more interest um, in the equity space. Uh, based on the lower yields in the in the fixed in, in income space. So, what are the opening calls in the market like today? Could you run us through those numbers? Yeah, I mean, so far it's been a quiet start. Uh, most of the activity has been in MTN. Uh, we've seen MTN um, is responsible for about 95% of the total uh, market value that has traded so far. About uh, roughly five billion shares have traded so far. Um, from what we have seen, is mostly local investors that are involved in those transactions. Uh, we expect the rest of the market to pick up you know, as the session goes on, but so far it's mostly been MTN that has been driving activities. So is there any market news that investors should be looking out for this week? Um, I think most of the, it's, it's, it's looking like a quiet week. Uh, most of the companies that had declared dividends, they've been marked down. Um, so, so far, I mean, this week is looking a bit quiet. All right, Afalabi Benro, thank you for your input on the program. Afalabi Benro is a stockbroker at Stambik IBTC. I think we'll have to take a break from the market. Over to you, BC. Of course, Adidio and Gam will be getting back to you in just a moment for a review of the debt and currencies market. Plus, we'll be crossing over to our London studio to see what's happening there this morning. Do stay with us. <music> Now, let's get a sense of what's happening in the UK market space this morning from Juliana Olayinka. Good morning, Juliana. Well, let's kick off our conversation with this warning from the UK Treasury to new business banking resolution service to prepare for a surge in grievances over government-backed COVID loans. Of course, we know that the business banking resolution service set to launch in mid-November was preparing to tackle cases dating back to 2001. But what's the reason behind the Treasury's warning? Well, the Treasury's warning is in line uh, with the uh, billions of pounds that have been lent to small to medium-sized enterprises during the pandemic. Uh, the, the business um, uh, uh, regulatory scheme will mainly be dealing with the coronavirus business interrupted loan scheme, which lent to 60,000 businesses to the tune of about £14 billion. Uh, now, before this BBLS uh, was uh, due to start, in November next uh, year, the uh, financial lending system here in the UK was unregulated. And we know that during the pandemic, several uh, businesses were complaining that some of the lenders uh, were, were, were too bureaucratic. There was too much red tape and they were unable to access money. Uh, so now this has been uh, put forward to deal with uh, several individuals and several big companies that still have complaints about uh, how they were handled during the pandemic. About seven of the this country's biggest banking um, uh, lenders have signed up to the scheme. And if a customer wins an, uh, one of their cases, uh, then the banks will have to pay up to £600,000 per incident. Now, the government has announced plans to bring forward a ban on fossil fuels to 2030. But how will this trigger a green economic recovery from the coronavirus pandemic? 
Well, we're not certain, and we'll hear more about this when Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, outlines uh, some of the, the some of the ways forward in autumn. Uh, we know that electric cars um, are becoming the new thing. All you have to do is look at Tesla's uh, uh, recent shares to know that this is where the world is heading. And in Europe, um, currently Norway lead the way in a ban on petrol and diesel cars. They'll be banning them um, in 2025. The initial date that Britain had was 2014 which is in line with France. Uh, but now, due to the pandemic, they've accelerated that push. So by 2030, it uh, will be illegal. There will be no cars uh, being made or sold in the UK uh, that are from the old-fashioned way. Um, it will be fossil fuel free and it will be electric. So this is one of the ways Boris Johnson is trying to uh, lead the march and lead the call in this electric, um, this uh, uh, emergency of the climate. And so, yes, in 2030, um, all the cars on British roads will be electric. Oh, we'll see how all that plays out. But Ben, it's a brand new week, Juliana. What are we to expect? It is a brand new week. Uh, here in the UK, the, the conversation is squarely focused on COVID-19. Uh, we've been told by uh, the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, that the country really is at a critical knife edge on whether or not we will be going into a second national lockdown. And I don't think it's if, it's really when. There are some suggestions that this may happen in October during uh, the children's um, half term. Some are expecting it to be within the next couple of days. At 11 o'clock, there is going to be an emergency briefing being held by the two uh, main scientific advisors here in the UK. They will outline exactly where the country is and where the country is expected to be. A couple of hours after that, we're expecting Prime Minister Boris Johnson to address the nations. Um, as we have been since March, we are about six, four to six weeks behind the trajectory we're seeing in France and Spain. Spain's daily death toll is now becoming a regular of 250 people dying every day. And so there are major concerns. It's much colder here. Uh, Boris Johnson has already advised the the, the, the public to get prepared for a second wave. The second wave is truly here. Uh, but now uh, the question is when uh, the country will be going into a lockdown. We may find out later today. All right, Juliana, thank you. And well, we'll see you again at 1.30. Thank you. And now let's get back to Edidio for a review of the debt and currencies market. Over to you, Eddie. Thank you, BC. Well, the bond market was bullish last week despite higher inflation numbers and the average yield contracted by about 51 basis points. On Friday, we had 38 deals worth 15.10 billion naira. Overall, the treasury bills market was bullish last week. Now, for the Nigerian treasury bills market, that market, the um, average yield contracted by about 10 basis points. We saw a lot of, we saw more demand on the September 20th. 2021. On Friday, we had 10 deals worth 9.2 billion naira. The OMO market was also bearish last week as investors um, took position in low, in short term um, stocks. We had 20 deals on that counter on Friday worth 21.70 billion naira. Femi Ogundimi of Fixed Income Deal at Access Bank will be joining us now to talk more about the market. Good morning, Femi. Thank you for joining us on the program. Good morning. So the DMO is having an auction on Wednesday. What exactly should we be expecting? Um, so, um, like you mentioned, uh, DMO has been issuing about um, 145 billion of four different maturities. Uh, they are reopenings. We have the we have the five years, we have the 25 years, we have the 30, 30 years, and um, you know, and um, another. Hello, Femi. Can you hear me? Okay, I think we've lost Femi there. But before we get him back, let's just look through the market one more time. So we, the all share index declined by about 0.08%. Now, although that was down, the equity cap was higher, about 0.10%. We saw about 1.13 billion units worth 12.69 billion are all traded in 17,109 deals. The banking sector dragged the market down last week. That was down by 0.67%, and that was due to declines from Zenith Bank, Ecobank Transnational Insurance, Stanbic Bank, and FBNH. Consumer goods was down 0.13%, while industrial and insurance gained. Uh, Femi, good morning. Can you hear me? 
Yes, I can. Um, yeah, so you were talking about the so, DMO's auction and what we should be expecting. Yeah. Could you go on? Yeah, so I was saying that um, they were hoping for maturities, the 2026 maturity, 2035, 20, 2045, and 2050. Um, this rate, this market, this auction, the auction, we expect this to reflect what the market is doing currently. At the market right now, um, the yields are relatively stable. We've seen a lot of um, activity with the market. Um, it's quite mixed. Um, we've, we've seen offers and also seen demand for. Um, the demand for the demand uh, for demand that we've seen in the market. So, from 2050, for instance, um, we currently trading up at 9.95 levels. From 2045, it's around 9.7 levels. For the 2035, it's currently around um, 9.4, 9.5 levels. So we expect that um, at, the, at the auction that um, we'll see uh, this. This the stock rate closing at the levels at the, that you see in the market. However, in terms of liquidity supply, we expect that um, it will be oversubscribed, given that there is a liquidity system. Currently, we have about 200 billion that came at our Friday closing. Um, after closing, we saw a FAC inflows coming, so we expect more maturity in the system. Also, there's been coupon payments in the past um, couple of last week, about 140 billion, about 18 billion coming in this week. So this liquidity is going to drive the sentiment at the auction. We expect more demand at this auction, so it will be highly subscribed. However, the demand um, at the auction will also tell on what the rate will be. So we expect to maybe like it will be doing what market is doing, but slightly less than what market is doing currently. Okay, away from the auction now, last week the fixed income market was mostly bullish. Should we be expecting those same sentiments this week? Yes, like I mentioned, market is relatively liquid, so we expect that um, this uh, liquidity drives um, sentiment in market. So liquidity drives buying interest. So we expect that, um, given the liquidity system, there will be still buying buying interest in the market. So it depends on which market and how looking out. If you're looking at a treasury-based market, a treasury-based market there's not much supply, so it's bullish, and so we can see yields trending lower at that market. However, the bond market, like I mentioned, um, there's demand for securities. Also, there's also supply of securities. So it's, it's a mixed market um, if you compare, compare the, bond, bond, the bond market. All right, Femi, thank you for your input on the program. Do enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Femi Ogundumu is a fixed income dealer at Access Bank. Well, we'll leave you here on the market to be for today. Over to you, BC. All right, there, Dee Young. And uh, as always, we'll hope for a profitable trading day and, of course, a profitable trading week. And, and that's our program today. Thank you for watching. I am BC Adebayo.